I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In episode 30 of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, I mentioned that the prophet Daniel was given a great prophecy of events that spanned more than 2,000 years. This prophecy can be found in Daniel chapter 9 and covers a period of 70 weeks of years, or a 490 year period that would begin with the building of the wall of Jerusalem in the days of Nehemiah until the end of the age which the world is fast approaching. Revelations chapters 6 through to 19 deal with the final seven year period of Daniel's prophecy that Jesus also refers to in his Olivet Discourse. I also mentioned that many Bible commentators agree that the seven year period is still unfulfilled but when it begins, it will be largely and closely associated with the nation of Israel. One fact that we can all be sure of is Satan's hatred of the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Satan hates the Jews with a passion for several reasons. God chose them to be his witnesses to the world. Through them God gave the world the Bible. Through them God gave the world the Messiah. God has promised that he will save a great remnant of them. God has promised that through the remnant he will bless all the nations of the world during the millennial reign of Jesus. So Satan is determined to destroy every Jew on planet earth so that God cannot keep his promises to them. Part of Satan's strategy has been to infect the church with what is historically called supersessionism. This is the idea that God has replaced the Jews with the church. It's only in the 20th century that this concept came to be known as replacement theology and it is a virulent form of anti-Semiticism. Replacement theology teaches that, firstly, the Jews should be considered Christ killers and should be mistreated accordingly, and secondly, the church has replaced Israel, and God has no future purpose for the Jews. In 1924, at a Christian gathering in Berlin, Hitler spoke to thousands and received a standing ovation when he made the following proclamation, I believe that today I am acting in accordance with the will of Almighty God as I announce the most important work that Christians could undertake, and that is to be against the Jews and get rid of them once and for all. The terrible truth that many believers do not like to face, even though they might be unaware of it, is that the Holocaust is the product of 1900 years of poisonous Christian replacement theology. But in John 4 verses 22, Jesus Christ himself declares the truth that every Gentile Christian owes his eternal life to the Jews. He said, You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. From Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures record the past and future history of the world primarily as it relates to the nation of Israel. Of course, in the Old Testament, Israel is exclusively at the focus of events. However, in the New Testament, a new concept is introduced, a church comprising not only of Jews, but Gentiles as well. But even in the New Testament, it is Israel that occupies center stage, for the promises that we as believers cherish were given originally to and belong to the Jews. Look at what Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6 says about the place of Israel in God's plan. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In Paul's letter to the Romans, three chapters are devoted exclusively to the exposition of the place of Israel in the eternal plan of God. Romans 9 tells us how God has dealt with Israel in times past. Romans 10 covers the condition of Israel at the present time, existing in a state of unbelief, having rejected the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. Romans 11 is all about how God will restore Israel to its former prominence among the nations of the earth. Even now, in the 21st century, Israel occupies center stage in world events. It is because Israel occupies a central place in God's program of human history. God will not let the world forget or ignore the Jewish people. The central place of Israel in history in current events and in God's plan for the future is abundantly clear. Yet a large number of Bible scholars ignore the important place God has reserved for Israel. These are the replacement theologians. The same grace which God has shown to his church is still being displayed towards his people Israel. Now, as we open the pages of Revelation 7, 
we shall see the culmination of his plan for Israel. We have already discovered in our study of the earlier chapters of Revelation that the next prophetic event the world will experience is the rapture, or the removal of the church from the world. Not only will the living saints that are in the world at that time will be caught up to be with the Lord, but those Christian saints who have died will also be raised. This event is described in detail by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Millions of people will simply disappear from earth, mysteriously, suddenly, and without a trace. Imagine the staggering effect that this event will have on all those who are left. That is how the last days of human history will begin. Immediately after this event, God's program of judgment commences and the center of this program will be the nation of Israel. In Revelation chapter 6, the time of judgment will be a dark and frightening time. We as Christians do not take pleasure in the terrible cataclysmic suffering of that period, but we should look forward to the time of victory, peace and worldwide blessing that follows the terrible time of judgment. We should always see beyond the judgment to a time of peace and restoration, yet we must recognize the reality of God's judgment. In Revelation chapter 6, we saw the opening of six seals of judgment. As we come to the Revelation chapter 7, we come to a pause between the first six seals and the seventh and final seal. In this interlude, in Revelation 7, God shows us what I feel to be a flashback. A flashback, of course, is a storytelling device used in books and movies to supply an event from the character's past that gives context to the present flow of the story. In Revelation chapter 7, we are shown a flashback that supplies a missing piece of the Revelation puzzle. We are taken back to the beginning of the judgments of the seven-year tribulation period to see the working out of God's plan from a different vantage point. What we will see in this flashback is the selection of a special group of Jews who will be given a special mission during these last days. Here is that flashback in Revelation 7 verses 1 to 3. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. At the beginning of Revelation, we are told that much of the truth of this book is shown to us by symbols. Revelation 1 verses 1 says, and this is from the American Standard Version, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his servants, even the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. The book of Revelation is a blend of literal events and symbols, and there are certain symbols to be found in the opening words of Revelation chapter 7. One such symbol that is used is the phrase, the four corners of the earth. This phrase simply refers to the four compass directions, north, south, east and west, and not to four physical corners of the globe. People today use this same expression to signify far-off regions. In this passage, four angels are depicted as holding back something that is about to come upon the earth. They have been commanded to restrain the four winds which symbolize the devastating power of natural forces. If you consider the destructive forces of hurricanes or tornadoes, you have some idea of the raw destructive power of an uncontrollable wind. That is the kind of power that these verses show as being held back for a time, until they are allowed to be released on the earth. The land, the sea and the trees are also symbolic in this passage. The land or the earth was frequently used as a symbol of Israel throughout the Old Testament because of the God-based structure, order and foundation of Israel, it was depicted as land. The symbol of the sea is often used throughout scripture to describe the pagan Gentile nations in general. 
The sea is shifting and unstable and symbolizes those who are without foundation because they do not recognize the authority of God. The people symbolized by the sea worship idols and hold pagan concepts which make them morally and socially unstable. The symbol of trees is often used to denote individuals in various places in scripture. For example, Psalm 1 verses 3 speaks of a godly man as like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Trees are symbols of influential men and women, people of authority who stand out from the crowd like tall trees in the forest. The four angels who hold back the winds are the first four of the seven angels which sound their trumpets in the following chapters of Revelation. The reason I say this is that if you carefully compare what takes place under the judgment of the seven angels, you will see that the first four of the seven angels control events that affect the land, the sea, and the trees. In this passage, the four angels are commanded to hold back the winds of destruction until a very important group of people has been sealed by God. The very special angel who seals this group is described as coming up from the east, or more literally, from the rising of the sun, if you look into the original Greek. This points to the prophecy of Malachi 4 verses 2, the last book of the Old Testament. This is what the verse says, But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. This is a poetic description of the coming of Jesus Christ in power and in glory. So this event relates to the coming of Christ. This special group is marked by the angel of the rising sun with the seal of God's ownership. There should be no mystery about what it means when this special group is sealed by God. Today, all believers are sealed by God in a special way. The following scriptures, Ephesians 1 verses 13, Ephesians 4 verses 30, and 2 Corinthians 1 verses 22 all confirm this. I will let you look these up and read them yourselves. The presence of the Holy Spirit in us as Christians is the unmistakable mark of God's ownership upon our lives. Romans 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. The same Holy Spirit who has sealed us as God's children will also seal this chosen group that is described in Revelation chapter 7. This group is therefore spirit-filled, spirit-led people. The seal is placed upon their foreheads, which indicates that the spirit rules over their minds, their thoughts, and their will. They are governed by the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2 verses 1 to 5, Paul describes this state of mind so beautifully. He says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ. This is the mind of one who, although possessing all the rights to infinite power and honor, willingly laid everything aside and became a servant. That is the mind of Christ. You will notice that the select group in Revelation chapter 7 is collectively referred to in verse 3 as the servants of our God. They serve with that same Christ-like willingness to give fully of themselves and to lay aside their own rights for the cause of God and for the sake of others. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is meant to be both a comfort and a challenge to us. We are comforted in that it assures us that we belong to Him. We are challenged by it to depart from all evil and identify ourselves with the one we belong to. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 32.